you join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. We thank you that we can be part of a faith community where we can come when we are joyful and when we are sad. We thank you because it is in our love from you and from each other that we find the strength to face anything in front of us. And so may you speak to us today that we may remember that even in the midst of awful circumstances and suffering, you are right there with us. In Christ's name we all pray. Amen. I think that it would be very unfair for me to try to even try to explain or imagine or understand the, the kind of suffering that Job is going through as we have read uh, last week and this week. I think that Chelsea did a great job last week of telling us uh, the circumstances that brought Job to this place where we are today in the midst of having lost literally everything, uh, his family, uh, his possessions, his health. Then uh, we see Job going through this, and his health. We go through this whole process with Job of uh, him being in this place of um, trying to understand what is happening to him and to try to make sense in his faith and his connection with God of what's going on. And then, um, as, again, as Chelsea told us last week, his best friends, they come and, and, and to be with him. And so for seven days, they don't say a word, just trying to be there with him in companionship, in solidarity, so that they, he may know that, you know, they're there with him. But then you, we will see that in later chapters, these friends are actually going to talk, and boy, do they talk, and do they have opinions about everything that is happening to um, Job. And, you know... Here's maybe one lesson for all of us. When someone's, someone is in great suffering, the worst thing that we can do is to get into this victim blaming or complaining about what is going on. I think that the best thing that we can do, if you don't remember anything about this sermon, is just not to say anything, but just to be there with the people. But, you know, the friends come, and I, certainly we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're trying to be supportive and helpful, but they say a lot of really hurtful things. Sandwich in between... The moment of silence and this unhealthy conversation of the friends with Job, you have chapter 3, which is what we heard today, which is here Job speaking, actually praying. And it is a prayer that is expressing a great deal of pain, a great deal of suffering, a great deal of anger and frustration for having lost everything. And um, in this prayer, you know, as I was hearing uh, Gail reading the scripture, wow, it's really, it's a really strong, I will say, an R-rated prayer in some ways. If you paid attention to the harsh words where, where Job is telling God, I wish I wasn't born. I wish you would erase the night when I was conceived. I wish there would just be darkness and I wouldn't be here. It is a prayer that reflects uh, a, a deep moment of grieving for Job, where, as we can see, uh, when you think about those five stages of grief, you know, when you talk about, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, uh, depression, and acceptance, certainly Job is experiencing all of them except the, the, you know, the acceptance. But you see Job really in a very difficult place um, expressing to God what is happening to him. And although the words are very harsh and difficult for us to hear maybe this morning in our, you know, beautiful church ears, I think that at the same time, this prayer is actually one of the most beautiful things that we get to hear in the book of Job. It is because in the midst of this awful suffering, Job praise to God. Job knows that God can hear, God can feel, God can understand, 
and God can put up with our rawness of how we feel. I mean, I don't know if you paid attention, but um, th this, this wasn't a, a fancy, sanitized, beautiful prayer. I don't know, the, in, in this prayer, we didn't hear any thou's or beseech thee or lords or almighty God or any of those fancy words that we use to pray to God. What you hear again in this prayer is someone that knows God and is, and is known by God, someone who has a, a very intimate connection. I remember um, as a younger person when um, my mentor, not, you know, when I was, you know, in seminary, I had a mentor uh, teaching me and helping me to, you know, to become a pastor. And uh, one of our young friends who was also, he was also his mentor. Um, I remember that at times my friend would get really angry at my mentor, you know, and, and, and uh, he would say things like, I was like, what? You know, why are you saying those things to him? Why are you, talk why are you being so disrespectful? And um, later I will come to understand that it was because as his mentor and as someone that he loved, he knew that he could come to him and express the deep pains and the deep questions and frustrations that he had because there was this bond of love between them. And so what we see here with Job is this really strong bond between Job and God, who, again, he comes to God knowing that God would understand and hear. Now, here's the other interesting thing. When the friends, like I mentioned earlier, they come and talk to Job, you know, they're trying to explain to him, well, you know, God thinks this way, God is this way, God is acting this way. They're great at explaining about God. But none of them pray. They're great at theology. They're great at explaining with the head what is happening to Job and who God is. But from all of them, Job is the only one who breaks through and prays to God. He's the only one who is not interested in theology. Job is not, that's not going to make him feel better right now. What's going to make him feel better is to have this connection with God in prayer. And if you think about it, you will realize that then that the book of Job is one of the most beautiful books about prayer written in the entire history of humanity. Because it teaches us what prayer, what true prayer is all about. It's not about the fancy words. It's not about the sanitized ways that we talk to God in public. It's really about this relationship with God, where we get to express who we are, the joys that we have, the frustrations, the pain, the suffering. And in fact, God can take it. Where we can come to God and be ourselves and be honest so that God might be able to take that pain and suffering that we have. Now, you see... Um, what Job will discover, we're in the early parts of the book, but what Job will, you know, gradually begin to discover is that in the, mid, in the midst of his grieving, he will know that God is also grieving with him, that God is hurting with him, God is suffering with him. And in that connection, eventually, I mean, I'm fast forwarding, you know, to the end of the book, so spoiler alert, you know, Job is coming to understand that even in the midst of this awful moment, God is there and, and God is going to bring life. A very different life, a very different faith, very different priorities, a very different understanding. But God's love is going to make his, its way into, into, into Job's life. You know, as human beings, you know, <laughs> we can be very stubborn. And we certainly, we certainly would understand and, and agree that God loves us. Um, but many times we're not open to that love. Because that love, from God's perspective, means that we're, we're, we're going to cease being selfish and self-centered and more forgiving and more understanding. So we, we like that in our heads. But... Many times the only way the door of our hearts is open to love is through suffering. We have strong egos, we have strong personalities, and you know, we're very full of ourselves many times. 
And the only way we can be open to the possibility that we need to change is when we go through this suffering. Not that God is punishing us, but that suffering becomes the way our hearts open and God's light and love comes into our hearts. In many ways, Job's life becomes to us a foreshadowing of who Jesus is. Because when you think about it, Jesus as the son of God, he came to be in our midst and as he comes to be among us, he wasn't protected from not suffering. He was not protected from the betrayal of his best friends or he was not protected from the anger of the religious people. He was not protected from, from Pilate or the Romans or anything like that. Jesus came into this world and he actually placed himself in a position where he knew that suffering would be part of his life. And he didn't run away from it. He wasn't happy necessarily about it. He was at times frustrated and grieved and, and it was hard like all of us because Jesus was human like you and me. But Jesus knew that in the end, suffering became the door for others to see God's love. And as you heard in the gospel story, you know, this is one of my favorite passages, you know, this Last Supper, you know, the one where we get to hear a lot here because Chelsea and I love that passage. But you get to see in this three or four verses that you heard this morning, this, this last moments of, of the Last Supper where Jesus takes the bread and, and he blesses the bread and he breaks the bread and he gives to the disciples. And in many ways, in that movement of taking the bread and blessing the bread and breaking the bread and giving it, we, we really see a pattern of what it means to all of, for all of us to, to be followers of Christ. Where, where we know that God is inviting us to a new life and we're taken, we're taken by God, we're chosen by God and then God is blessing us to go into the world and to, and to be God's people but as we are chosen to be God's people and blessed to be God's people, evil and suffering may come and break our ego. Things are not gonna go the way we want them and we're gonna suffer. But as we suffer, we are given away and we are given away in a way that people are gonna be fed. People are gonna be fed with God's compassion and goodness. People are gonna be nurtured and they're gonna see in our lives the love of God. And that is exactly what we encounter here with Job. You know, we began this sermon series about Job and we started it on All Saints Sunday to make the point that Job is a saint. You know, in, in a, he's a saint who curses. I mean, I don't wanna, want you to raise your hand if you curse, but you know, he's a saint and in his prayer, he's, he's cussing God, he's angry at God and he's raw with God. He's, he's showing that side of him. God takes it, God blesses it. Evil breaks that ego and and then he gives us Job again as a lesson for all of us that in the midst of our grieving and our suffering, there is the hope of new life. There is the hope for resurrection. And so as we look at the world and particularly on a day like today when we're remembering the end of World War I, you know, when, when World War I, for those of you who are history buffs, you might come to correct me, but at least some people thought, this is, we are so advanced that this is the last war we're gonna have. Humanity, we get it, we got it. It's not good to be fighting and killing each other. Only for 20 years later to be engaged in the same war, and we haven't stopped since. On a day like today when suffering is real, for you as a person, for us as a nation, for us as a world, it is important to remember that in the midst of awful circumstances, if we stick with God, God can bring goodness and love and compassion and peace and justice out of this suffering. Because that's 
what Job is teaching us this morning. May we know that when theology doesn't help us, that when the words of our friends and family are not really consoling us, may we know that we can go to God in prayer. And that as we go to God in prayer, that God can take our suffering. God can dwell in our suffering and bring life out of our suffering. Amen.